was also could be refined if you had some better data. So that's what started um, me thinking about this uh, particular, pro uh, particular problem. Um, I didn't really see very much about other types of uh, vehicles either. So people who go to uh, school on a train, on a tube, or, or a bus. Um, and then uh, the other thing was the, as I say, the, the actual network distances. You have to look, find a way of predicting how people go go to school, which roads they go down. Um, and, and my interest is of geocomputation. I think that, that offered a offered a solution. So the challenges for the work were to, to estimate for all pupils a uh, street level distance, um, how far they travel to school. Um, and then how you could actually account for differences in CO2 values, both in the types of uh, vehicles which were used, um, and then also how you could actually refine that to sort of more uh, uh, disaggregated geography. So if you, for example, knew what the typical characteristics of the vehicles were within, a, within an area, uh, you could actually use that data to calibrate the model. So it was combining all these things together uh, to come up with a solution. And this is the model uh, I created, um, and it's basically it's very similar to the, the model I showed you previously. You multiply distance by a CO2 value uh, for, a, for a single pupil uh, between two locations, the distance between I and J for a particular transport type. So uh, the transport type refers to the network. So if you were going uh, between two locations, predominantly by train, that's a different network than if you were going by a road. Uh, <coughs> the the uh, estimates for the actual uh, transport type vary. And they also vary by geography as well. The geography is used flexibly within the model. So you'll see in a minute, um, I've got L, uh, lower superaltitude area levels, estimates of uh, CO2 emissions of vehicles within, registered within those areas. Uh, but in the context of, um, say, light rail, it refers to the light rail network because there's different CO2 value, emissions values attributed to those different light rail networks because they have different average sort of usage characteristics and the types of vehicles that run on the tracks are different. So, that accounts for that. And the final parameter in the model is a weighting parameter. Uh, and that basically adjusts uh, the estimates on the basis of um, where the actual estimate value for the CO2 emissions, uh, E, um, the uh, average occupancy of those vehicles is accounted for. And that really only, in this particular model, uh, accounts for um, car sharing. So if you look in the literature, it's basically an average of two children, so you multiply it by half. Uh, and then that gives you your estimate. And again, you multiply by two. Again, in the literature, you find that people typically use the same transport modes to and from school. Um, education data: um, seven million pupil records, and that's all the school years, so nursery through to um, A levels. Uh, it's mainly uh, state school uh, pupils. You get occasional uh, independent schools in there. If at some point in their educational career they've actually been to a state school. Um, and from that, you actually get uh, the postcodes of where the uh, people live. And the uh, Department of Education kind of gave me that. Uh, you know which school they went to, so you can get the postcode of where the school is as well. So you've got your origin and destination locations. Vehicle data. Um, uh, an ex-colleague of mine when I was at UCL, uh, Darren Lloyd, uh, works for the Department of Transport. And he very kindly generated this data for me. And it's based on the um, DVLA data. Uh, new cars now, uh, since 2001. Uh, have to have uh, these emissions uh, tests, and, it, and it's a it's a test which they um, uh, they run the car in lots of different driving conditions to get this average value of CO2 emissions. Uh, but that's only for cars like after uh, 2001. Um, and taking all those all the cars which are registered on the DVLA database, uh, you can actually create an average <coughs> CO2 value for quite small area geographies, and that's what we use in the model. Uh, the caveat for that, if you actually look at the average um, CO2 value for all the vehicles in that database, it possibly underestimates the true estimate. I'm not sure how the DEFRA estimate came up, but it, there is a difference between those two. Uh, the other thing which might happen is there might be specific types of cars for school runs. So do people typically use people carriers? I don't know. Uh, there isn't any literature on that as far as I can tell. Um, so that's what the data looks like, you've probably never seen it before. So this is the average CO2 emissions of vehicles at LSOA level uh, for England. Um, basically the darker, the brown, dark brown means uh, not especially polluting, uh, dark green means quite polluting. You can see there's uh, a lot more polluting cars in South East of England. Uh, we do quite well, um, sort of the Wirral and Liverpool, uh, Cornwall. Uh, and a lot of, you get these interesting sort of coastal patterns as well. So these are all stored in the data. 
Uh, and then these are the um, values which the government used from their own sort of uh, CO2 modelling estimates uh, for the different types of uh, uh, transport types, so taxis, buses, they differentiate between London and non London buses, coaches. Um, <coughs> they've also got uh, estimates for the different types of light rail, uh, uh, di uh, different types of light rail networks. And then these last two as well, cycling and walking, also have CO2 emissions attributed to them. So those are the other estimates we've the model. Um, basically what I did was I used a series of software. One uh, is a software package called Routino, which is used for street level uh, network routing. Uh, and what you do is you dump the open street map data into that, it processes it and you can feed it origin destination locations. Also from open street map we extracted um, the light rail and tube network uh, from OSM. And that required a lot of cleaning because the OSM data is quite detailed. So for a railway line or a tube line you might have uh, the multiple tracks which actually run down those uh, locations. Uh, for routing problems, you need to simplify those to a single line and also make sure that the intersections of the tracks where the train could change direction, uh, the nodes intersect. So I manually edited, it took, I mean, it took weeks and weeks to do that, it was extremely boring, but um, create this uh, data set which uh, uh, again using QGIS. Um, and that data was dumped into a uh, PostGIS database, an extension to PostgreSQL. The railway data um, was quite clean already, and that came from uh, Meridian 2, and again, all that went into uh, PostGIS as well. Similarly, the education and the uh, transport data went in there as well, so it was all stored in the same location. <coughs> and, and this is basically the software uh, infrastructure that <coughs> I implemented, and this is how the algorithm works. It, Sent a query to the database from R. Uh, Rich, how long have I got that? About five minutes. Oh, okay, good. Um, sent a data, uh, query to the database, gets uh, an origin destination and the mode type. Um, it looks at the mode choice, so how they travel to school. If it's a light rail, um, it sends uh, a query to the um, PG routing extension for PostgreSQL, uh, and it calculates a route on an appropriate uh, rail network or light rail network. Uh, if it's road, it sends it to Routino, again, it returns. Uh, in terms of distance travelled, so then you have the pupil, uh, the distance, and the mode type. If it's car based, it looks in the database again, uh, and for the El SOA in which the pupil resides, uh, it takes the average CO2 value for the uh, transport, uh, for the cars which are located within that zone. Uh, and for any other type, uh, it uses the average values, uh, and that could also be the values attributed to a particular transport network as well. So if it's the metro in Newcastle versus the uh, sort of, uh, light rail system in Sheffield. So you get your CO2 value, implements the model, uh, and it stores the results back in the database. Um, I've just got, so the main thing I wanted to talk about was sort of how I was doing that. So I haven't seen it implemented in that way before, but this is the result of, of what I've done. So what this does, this looks at the results from my model versus a sort of un geographical model, if you like. So this looks at straight line distance, so the way I showed you at the start of the lecture, and um, uh, the national averages, so not using the geographical averages. So what this means is if you're using straight line distance, you're overestimating in these sort of blue areas and underestimating in these green areas. That makes sense because if you remember looking at the map, particularly around South East London, uh, South East, and in London there were more polluting value, uh, more polluting vehicles, which generally were higher emissions values than those uh, which are typically used, um, uh, which are higher than the national average of the depth of uh, So that's uh, sort of the national results. Other interesting things you can look at, uh, this is looking at mode choice. Um, this is the percentage of people adopting that mode choice. This is distance from the school. So um, 0 to 5 kilometers, almost 100% of people walk. As you uh, increase the distance from the school, that percentage drops um, around Something that's about that's two to two and a half kilometres. It's more prevalent when you start driving in the car, uh, and then you get similar results, uh, similar sort of train increases over time, uh, over distance rather, uh, uh, and car drops off again, and then adopted bus as well, uh, around four and a half to five kilometres. But it's more. In, this is the national data set, so this is all school years. It's actually more interesting when you break it down. It's a bit blurry. But what you find is you get step changes in those graphs, um, certainly between years six and seven, uh, which is obviously when you go from primary school to secondary school, 
Um, and typically that's when you sort of mum and dad say, oh, you, you know, you've grown up enough to walk to school, or you know, they're not holding your hand, or they can't be bothered to walk you to your secondary school, which is further than your house. <laughs> so so the, the, these behavioural choices sort of change over time. You also get interesting patterns <coughs> when uh, buses kick in as well, and obviously so this bus data also includes uh, like school coaches, so if it's put on by your local authority, and there, there are geographical differences to this as well. Um, because not all local authorities will provide school buses and so on. So again, this is the other sort of data that you can generate from here. And then also you can model this right down to a local level. And what I want to look at next is actually mapping this to street level. Um, the idea being is if you know which streets people are going on, you could almost map the CO2 emissions down to individual streets. I don't know, maybe use that information for sort of routine walks, for example. So next steps as well, um, I did talk a huge amount of detail about the, mo the model, but there are problems with um, the bus, bus routes, there aren't any uh, data for actually uh, working out the bus network, at the moment. So, or it's patchy, should I say. Uh, so I'd like to be able to implement that uh, using the actual bus routes. You'd also want to calibrate into the, the estimate of distance between uh, the house and the bus stop, so again you want to add that in. Uh, multimodal journeys, although that's not captured in the education data, um, it's fairly obvious um, if you look at some of the types of transport used within certain areas that, uh, you know, if you, were, you, if you typically use light rail, for example, you would always have to walk to the stop uh, at both ends from the school, uh, and depending if there was a, a bigger distance, you might even use a bus. So you could try and sort of create some heuristics to work out the multimodal journeys. Um, there's data issues in London, some of the data is confused because the school enters this data into the, into the, uh, the PLAS data. Uh, so the tube light rail uh, and rail gets mixed up. Uh, and again, I think there needs to be some more heuristics looking for errors. So, you know, areas where there aren't a tube, for example, it's very unlikely they're using a tube to go to school. Um, so you've got to look at that. Uh, scaling issues, um, it takes a very long time to run all these data. I mean, we're talking a couple of weeks. Uh, to process it, uh, and then also because this data is available over time, it'd be interesting to see. Uh, I think it's 07 to 2012 the data you can get. So whether any of the policy uh, that was implemented during that time actually had any impact on it. So that's basically it. And this is just an animation of the single days community living. This will go on far longer than I've got time for questions. So thanks very much. <laughs>